Welcome scholars! This is a help video for your Excel report for Module 3, your Statistics Module. We're going to go ahead and just jump right in here. For number one, we are talking about Americans' attitudes towards climate change, and those attitudes have been evolving very rapidly over the last few years. The tables below show responses to the survey question. From what you've read and heard, is there solid evidence that the temperature on Earth has been getting warmer over the past four decades? First, we asked this survey, we asked folks this question in the spring of 2010, and then again in the fall 2015. You can see that the responses had quite a big difference from spring 2010 to fall 2015. And we're going to examine the difference in these two sets of data by creating pie charts for each as well as bar charts for each. And then you're going to discuss the differences in the data and maybe think of some scenarios that might have occurred to create the differences in this data. We're also going to do one other thing. We're going to look at the percentages of data relative to the percentages of the sections of the pie chart. But don't worry about all this. We're going to talk about it as we go along. The first thing that I'm going to do, of course, is open an Excel page. I do like to always save files, save as, before I even start, folks. Usually, uh, uh, your updated Windows versions will automatically save your documents and the things you create as you create them if you have it saved. So, or if you don't, but keep it saved, keep it safe. And you can even continuously click save if, if you do not have an updated version of Windows and it doesn't automatically save. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and merge these cells, Alpha 1 through Golf 1. I simply select them and then press Merge. And then I am going to go ahead and type in my name and a description of what we're doing here, which our description is this is a Module 3 Excel. I want to make that bold, and I'm also going to move it all the way to the left. You know, you guys can you guys can see that when I'm clicked in this cell to type, I do not have the choice to center or align my text in any any particular way. So you just simply click outside that cell, click on it one time, and then you have these options. the The hardest one of the hardest things, or the hardest thing about using Excel is understanding how it wants you to click. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and merge a few more cells, another set of cells here. And I'm going to just label this just like I have written it here. This is number one. But, okay, so the, pro the reason why that didn't work is because I was not properly clicked inside of this cell. I need to double click, get my cursor in the cell, then I can type. And I'm also going to align this to the left. And I'm even going to make it bold. All right, if I was getting real fancy, I'd capitalize all of this stuff too. The first thing, um, let's go ahead and look at this. We want to construct a pie chart. So I know that I'm going to have to type this data in. I've already typed mine up, so you guys are going to get to type yours just like I typed mine to put it into this report over here, even though I do often use the dictate button, but not for the charts. All right, if if I want to create a pie chart, all I have to do, folks, is just select my box here. I can even select my titles, insert a pie chart. We, and we can do a plain pie chart. We can get a little more fun with our pie charts. Some different things that we can do if we wanted to highlight a particular piece of data. If we In this, this picture, we would be highlighting, it looks like probably the unsure data. Yep, because that's the least C10. Pretty cool, huh? Different things that we can do with, with our charts. I'm going to go ahead and put in the 3D pie chart just because it's cool. Not sure what happened to it, but I just go back here. If something doesn't work the first time, folks, just start over. 
All right, now in, look, see how it's already labeled? If I labeled my chart properly, then it will label my pie graph, my pie chart with everything that I have here. Pretty cool. I can still in Excel Windows 10, I have this option right here to press this plus sign and it gives me the option to add data labels. Others of you have different ways to add data labels. Some of you have to find some different features up here that help you do it. Um, different versions have different ways. If you have the most updated version, you have this green plus, which is of course the best. The regular default data labels, boring. No, thank you. Look at them. Doesn't even look fun, does it? Let's see what other options we have for data labels. I can center them, put them in different spots, and I'm sure that there are ways to change the fonts and the colors of the data labels. But in, and right here under more options, I'm sure that there are all kinds of things that we can do. But right now, uh, I am just going to do my favorite data label, and it is the shout out. Reminds me of cash cab or data call out. There we go. That looks good. So I'm going to leave it like that. Just kind of format these a little bit. Don't be sloppy with your work. Make things look good. All right. Very nice. Now let's look at, see this blue piece? This is 53% of the data. Well, if I were... Let's go here. I think I have this open. Yep, I sure do. Does this look familiar? This is depicted on, I think, I don't know, maybe five or more times on your homework, maybe a half a dozen or more. But this pie chart, this is actually this exact same problem um, with different numbers. But this pie chart that you guys are doing in your homework, the way you would do this is you would see that you have 53%. I, I know this blue thing says 54, but I'm going with my data. 53%. Well, you guys are taking a guess. A lot of you have been taking a guess on what 53% of this circle looks like, and you're just kind of drawing a line. And you're, you're messaging me and saying, I'm doing this over and over and over again. I can't get it. Here's why. Let me show you guys. I'm going to move this chart over. And now let's... Let's look at this. Here we want the degrees for the pie chart, the degrees of the circle. You can label this degrees if you want to, or you can call it the percent of 360. I can even label both if I want to. When you're running through your Excel report, if you label both of them, it'll be easier for you to talk about what this little column of data represents. Um, I'm also going to change this just because I want to show it that this that these are percents and I can select that data and hit percent and remember when we put a percent on something we move the decimal two places to the right when we take a percent off we move the decimal two places to the left so the problem with our data is that 53 percent um, I would have to have a decimal here so I'm just going to go ahead and put a decimal for each of these values. Look what it's doing to my pie chart. See how it leaves all of, wow, look at that. All right, now it all goes back to normal once everything's the same. And now I'm going to go ahead and say that these are percents just because I wanted to. So now here I'm going to put equals 53% of 360. 53% of 360 gives me 190.8 degrees. And then I'm just going to apply Excel. I did, I just did that by selecting that cell, getting my little black cross in the bottom right corner. And I can double click and it will apply it to however long my list is, or I can get my little black arrow and drag it down. All right, so now I have that this blue chunk, 53% of my data, 53% of my circle is 190.8 degrees. So on this homework problem, I would click right here where there's, on the homework problem, there's a little blank 
circle to the left of the percentage for those who said yes. This is a, a different format, so we don't have that here. But here I start at zero and I count 190.8 degrees. Well, there's 180 degrees, 190 degrees. 190.8 will be just before the two, um, just before the, let's see, there's 190.8. All right, so that's going to be just barely past, is that right? 190, 200. All right, yep, so just right past the 190 point. All right, so you guys would click, click, draw a line there. Now here's the part where a lot of folks, the other part, where a lot of folks are getting confused. Some people understand that. They even calculated these degrees and even counted and put their line just in the right place. But then what do you think they might have done? The next one is 133.2 degrees. So what folks are doing is they're coming back up here to zero and ticking off 133.2 degrees. But what you have to do is start right here at the 190.8 where you just left off and count. Here I'm at, what, about 191? So um, I have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 10, 20, 30, 133. And I don't want to confuse you guys, but... If you just counted up one more, 144, that would give you the one that you left off down here when you were counting. So 134, and then, where was that about? The next one you have is 36 degrees. So that would, that's probably going to end you up right about here. And then you would count off your 10, 20, 30, or so I guess it would have been up here. But 10, 20, 30, 40. So your 36 degrees would be the last piece. So your very last line would go from this dot straight up to the zero. Even though this line's already here, you still have to put that extra line. All right, so that's that's for the homework problem. But you guys ha now have that information, which you do have to discuss in your report. So it was not a waste of your time if you've already done that one. All right, now I need to get my other set of data. But even before I do that, I can go ahead and add in my bar chart. So I'm going to select my data, insert a bar chart. This is a histogram chart. Let's see. This is your bar chart. You have to know the difference between your histogram and your bar chart. So you have different choices on your bar charts here. I don't know. I just like the 3D pictures. I think they're cool, so I'm just going to use them. And now we can see different information from our different data or from our data set represented in different ways. Um, your access titles, you definitely want to title your access percent of people who answered. Down here we have the different answers possible. You guys are going to label all of that. I can add data labels if I want to. It's giving me these options, I don't really want to deal with those right now. I'm going to go back to my data labels and select this little arrow and put the callouts just because I like them. All right, so there's that set of information. And then we select the second set of information. Well, you guys will, you know, just paste it in there. And look, when I'm pasting something in Excel, if I select some crazy big, as long as I select the top left corner where I want something to go, and then I paste it in, Excel will say, look, the area you selected is, is not the same size as what you have what you want to paste. That's okay. Just press okay. All right. Also, another thing is I have merged cells right here. So I can't just move this around if I want to. But I can move it around if I select a bigger area. Which I just learned that a minute ago. So that's why I thought I would show it to you. And then you guys will go through the entire same process with this graph. And then you're going to discuss the differences 
you're going to see that these areas of the circle, the section sizes change, and you're going to discuss the changes. You're also going to talk about what are some scenarios that could have made those changes. From 2010 to 2015, all kinds of things happened. People became more aware. Some companies were making money off global warning, warming. So they sent out strong warnings and who knows, maybe made a bigger deal or a lesser deal of it. All kinds of different things that could have happened here. So I just want you to discuss why this data might have changed from 2010 to 2015. And then also in your report, you're going to give a quick description of how the percentage of the data set and the percentage of 360 gave you the degrees of the circle to create your pie chart. And that is number one, and I hope you're ready for number two. All right, everybody, let's jump into number two of our Excel report. Number two of our Excel report gives us some data lists. It gives us our first list is Helena and Juanita's class periods that they missed. And the second list is a list of heights. The first list of heights is a list of heights of army recruits. And the second list of heights is a list of heights of random mall shoppers. And what we're going to do is compare these two sets of data, um, check out the, the mean, median range, the standard deviation, and the co coefficient variation. So those are a lot of things that we're going to do. But you're, you're about to learn that that's all pretty easy when you have Excel. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and start setting up my problem. I'm just going to merge some cells. And then I'm going to type all my information in. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video, type in my information, and get some lists going here. So I'm going to pause that, and you guys go ahead and do yours too. Okay, everybody, I'm back. You can see I've filled in all of this information. I still have more stuff to fill in, but I thought I would wait to show you guys how I cut and paste. And I, I even left a couple of things because I want to show you how to move items. So you can see here that I've labeled range, median, mean, standard deviation, coefficient of variation, which are all of the things I was asked to calculate for part alpha. And there are some things happening here. First of all, once I record the values for these, I would rather it not be aligned with the first entry of my data. So I'm going to go ahead and take my data and move it down one. See how I select it? Use my white cross, click, hold drag, unclick, then I have to make sure I have just the right cursor. You see the little four, it looks like a weather vane cursor. I'm going to, and I'm going to move it down one. All right. And I'm going to, I actually could have, I actually could have done that because I'm going to actually do it for both sets of data if I wanted to. I could have done it all at once. I went one too far. So you guys can practice moving stuff around as part of using Excel. All right, so this one also, I did not yet type in range, median, median. I meant range, median, mean. So I'm going to go ahead and move this set of data down twice, or two cells, however you want to look at it. All right, now I am going to go ahead and select all of this right here. Control C or Control Charlie, and I am going to repaste it right here. Control Victor. All right, now I also have this down here. I'm going to just select this. Control Charlie, Control Victor. And then now I'm going to select all of this, Control Charlie, Control Victor, work smart, not hard, folks. It's okay to cut and paste when you're cutting and pasting your own original work. All right, a couple things I need to change. The fact that this is not Helena's Miss Classes. This is Juanita's Miss Classes. And these are not heights of Army recruits. These are heights of mall shoppers 
All right, now we get to do some fun and interesting things with Excel. Let me go ahead and click outside. You see how I have this cell? Right now I was just trying to make my screen a little bit smaller, but because I'm clicked inside of this cell, I cannot do that. So I simply click off anywhere and then I can make it smaller. All right, here we go. You guys are gonna like this. This is super cool. The next, well, not this next part is still cool, but it's the next part after that that's the coolest. So it says to calculate all of these things. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and start this one. In order to calculate my range, I need the small, the largest value minus the smallest value. So I am going to select this data And you know, for this particular set of data, we really can just see the range. I would have actually not, I would have rather not have asked you to look for the range on this set of data, but that's okay. Um, we're gonna find it anyway. So I select this and then I'm gonna sort it from the smallest to the largest. Now, if I press sort right here, it sorted both of these lists. I don't want my original list sorted, and that's because I'm going to create a scatter plot and it will mess up my scatter plot. I only want that list sorted. So I'm going to undo that. I'm going to sort again. Oops, did not mean to have that other data selected. The problem is I have everything selected. Just select just this row, column, sorry, sort from smallest to largest, and then continue with just the current selection. So make sure you guys click that. And now I just sorted just that new list because I don't want to sort my original list. And I only did that to grab my last value minus my largest value minus my smallest value. There may be another faster, better way, more efficient way to do this in Excel. I'm still learning Excel, so I don't know what that way is. But I do know how to do all this other stuff fast and efficient. I click, I click my equal sign, type median, or what do you guys have to type? Just M, and you can find median, M-E, and it, and it comes up right away. Double click, select the data from which you want to find the median, and we see that the median is three. And with a small list of data that's kind of easy to see, the median is going to be, once you order the data into a list. What do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this list of data had to um, add the two together and divide by two, but they're both three, so the two middle numbers. All right, what about my mean? The mean is equals, and we're not going to type in the word mean because it does only give us a uh, an offer or an option for a geometric mean, and we don't want the geometric mean, we just want the average. So the mean in this case is just average, or the mean in, in all cases is just average. So here we're gonna select this data again, hit enter, standard deviation, huge complicated formula, makes you fall asleep just looking at the formula, but in Excel, a standard deviation, you're gonna find STDEV, you have a lot of options, the standard deviation of the, pop um, <laughs> of the population, the sample, and other things. Here, I don't even know what all of them are, which I could easily find with a simple Google search. But I want this one, STDEV. Again, I'm going to select my set of data. And for all of these things, you guys could have selected either set of data. We just need our original set for our scatter plot. All right, and then here for a coefficient variate, coefficient of variation is simply the standard deviation divided by the mean. There's a homework problem, a couple of them, asking for the coefficient of variation. Folks, you just find the standard deviation, you find the mean, and there you are. And the hardest part of your homework problems is typing the numbers into a list. Seriously, everything else is done on Excel. It's pretty amazing. All right, now when you guys do this, I do expect to see other stuff done that I did not do. You know, I wanna see your your stuff 
color coded, labeled, make it easy to follow. Give your information colors, do things, um, put outlines on the outside borders of your charts, or not just outside, but I'm sorry, like all borders, and you get those nice lines there. If your lines aren't dark enough or they don't like the way you don't like the way they are, if they're too light or too small, you go to your borders, you go to line color. Look, folks, you can even change it to be highlighted in, a, in all different colors. You can change your line styles to be all different things. Um, this little pin will come up when you change your line style. You can select, but selecting things, it gets tedious. So you just hit escape and then again, reapply all borders and it will give you whichever line you asked it for. That one might give me just a little bit of a headache. So I'm going to go back to, back to my one that I like. I like the double line or you might just like a dark line, whatever you like. All right. So now I've calculated all that. You ready for, for the super duper cool thing? I'm going to select this. Control Charlie, come over here, Control Victor. Not only did I just get my color coding and my borders, but also check this out. Right here, Excel chose my, my proximity of those numbers. I just realized that I should probably, before I move on, I need to... I just press control C and now I'm control Victor. And now I'm going to order that list from Spurgist. All right, and now you see my range changed. Let's see how that looked. I'm gonna undo this. The first one, my range, it was selecting, there we go. You see how it's zero? That's because, look, there's nothing in the cells. See how when I initially on this set asked it to find the range of these two values? You see the proximity between the two values that it used is the exact same proximity between the two values that it used over here. So when I, oh, it won't let me um, put that back. That's okay. I'll just do it again real quick here. And then it instantly changes my, my range. Now look here on my median. You see my median used that list of data? Well, this median over here is using the list of data within the same proximity of that cell. It always uses with whatever's within that same proximity. Pretty cool, eh? All right, so now I am going to select this data again. I'm sorry, this these cells. And I'm gonna paste them in down here below the heights of army recruits. Now you guys will see, again, my range changed to zero and a few other things happened. I'm gonna go ahead and just select this data. For the second set of data, just because I know what's coming, because I've already done all of this, I'm gonna just go ahead and put my second list down below and order it that way. You'll see why later. Order from, all right, ordered it, no problem. And now for this one, I want my range to be from this bottom value to the top value of that list. All right, what about my median? For my median, you see how it used this entire list all the way down to a spot that was not part of it. This list is shorter than the list before it. So in order to calculate this list, see where it goes from Bravo 47 all the way down to Bravo 56, but I want it to stop at Bravo 55. So I have a couple choices. I can select right here where it says Bravo 56 and then just click the Bravo 55 cell and it will change it. 
or I can just change the six to a five. Those are my two choices. And my coefficient of variation will stay the same because it's simply the standard deviation divided by the mean, and it did choose the cells within the same proximity that it chose for the coefficient of variation up here. All right, now that I have that squared away, I am going to go ahead and select this set of data and paste it below. And you know, I I am assuming that you guys are already good at your clicking, I, and I know it's just not that easy clicking with Excel. When I have this white cross, I click, hold, drag, unclick, and then I control Victor, sort. If you haven't done the first two, Excel reports, you should go back and do those before you attempt to do this one. All right, so now um, what else do I have going on wrong here? You see this? I'm missing a space. I need, a, I need another space, so I'm just going to select this and move it up. It doesn't want to let me do that because the cells are merged where it says heights of mall shoppers and in inches. Um, it didn't like that, but it still went ahead and, and moved it. No problem. I'm just going to go through and merge the cells that I do want merged. A couple different ways that can be dealt with. All right, now I'm going to copy this, Control-C, Control-V. And it, again, chose all of the right cells because it's going by proximity. Pretty cool, eh? See that? All right, so I have just calculated the range, median, mean, standard deviation, and coefficient of variation for every set of data. What's next on my list? Next, I want to create a scatter plot and insert a trend line for each scatter plot. We're going to notice the correlation between the tightness of the data points about the trend lines relative to the coefficients of variation and the standard deviations. Don't worry, we'll talk about it as we move along here. All right, super simple. I'm going to choose the set of data that I have here. Remember that both of these columns are exactly the same. One's just reordered from smallest to greatest. I do need to use my original set of data to insert my scatter plot. There's my lovely scatter plot. I'm going to go ahead and move it right up into the space. And you guys remember when you're doing this that your Yours doesn't have to look exactly like mine, though. I know it's easiest to just copy mine, and that's fine, as long as you guys are learning how to use these functions. All right, so here's my lovely scatter plot, and now I am going to add the plus sign here, and I am going to add some axes. All right, down here, you guys are going to label your axes according to what they are. Classes missed, the frequency of those classes being missed. And then over here, we are also going to click trend line. And there are actually a lot of really cool things you guys can do with your trend lines. Um, you know, but we'll we'll look at that in in our next module. Module four, we look at more options with our trend lines. But for this one, I just want to stick a trend line in there. All right, and now I am going to do the same thing over here. I am going to insert a scatter plot. Get it moved right over into a nice position. And I'm going to add a trend line. All right, I'm just gonna keep rolling on with the same thing here. Select data, insert. I really didn't plan on doing all of this for you guys, but I'm so excited to get to talk to you about the way these numbers change. Um, but I just can't help it. I'm just going on with each set of data, inserting a scatter plot. All right, I have to go back over here and add my trend line. Now, if you guys don't have this plus sign to insert a trend line, you're going to have to Google inserting a trend line in Excel 
whatever you have, 2007, 2008, whatever Excel you're in, you just Google it. I learned how to do all of these things for every one of these problems by using Google. So you guys can, you guys can do that too. Um, and now this one, insert a trend line. All right, now let's have a look at this stuff. Here, I put my trend line in, you guys see, my coefficient of variation is 0.28. And you see how the data is somewhat follows along the trend line. There, there does seem to be some type of order, not really, but a little bit. But look at this set of data over here, Juanita. Juanita has no pattern on how she misses her classes. Hers are scattered so far about the trend line that you can't even, the trend line doesn't even make sense in this set of data. Do you see that? It really doesn't make too much sense over here, but more than it does over here. But the variation of the data is larger than the variation for the data that seemed closer about the trend line. Also look at the standard deviation. The standard deviation for this set of data is 3.5, which is pretty big considering the range of numbers. Over here, my set, my standard deviation is 0.79, which is smaller. The data is set more tightly around the trend line. Therefore, the coefficient of variation is smaller and the standard deviation is smaller. Kind of cool, eh? But look down here. Let's talk about this set of, set of data. This set of data, the trend line, look at that. The dots are practically on the trend line. Look at my coefficient of variation. It's 0 0.06. It's so small. And my standard deviation is 4, but I know the standard deviation is larger here, just barely larger than the standard deviation for Juanita's missed classes. But look at the, the range here is 9. On my recruits, I have a range of 14 and the numbers are much larger. But what you're gonna notice is over here on the heights of the mall shoppers, we do have a coefficient of variation that's a little bit, well, not a little bit, it's quite a bit bigger than the variation for the heights, but just a little bit smaller than the variation for Helena's missed classes. So you see how these, these variations can be compared. Even though this is a set of data for cla missed classes and this is a set of data for heights, I can still say, well, the variation for Helena's missed classes is very close to the variation between the heights of mall shoppers and inches. So that would be the only real way to compare this data from what we've collected, from the calculations that we've done, is to compare the variations in the sets of data. There's really nothing else that can be compared between missed classes and the heights of mall shoppers. But variation between sets of data can always be compared. All right, so let's go ahead and go back and see what's next on our list. Create a scatter plot, insert a trend line. Notice the correlations. We did notice the correlations between the tightness of data points about the trend line relative to the coefficient of variation and standard deviation. So make sure you guys include you don't have to go on and on like I did, but try to write a sentence or two about the correlation between all those numbers and proximity of the data points about the trend line. All right, I think we're done with the top set of data, and now we're just going to talk about the data sets for the heights of army recruits and mall shoppers. So the next thing we want to do here is create a box plot a box and whiskers plot for each list of heights. All right, well for our box and whiskers plots, we are gonna go ahead and use this set of data. We don't need to, actually, actually, I'm not going to. I'll use the other set of data and let the ordered set show you what happens here. So I'm just going to select this data and then I'm going to insert a box and whiskers. Box and whiskers are under the histogram, <laughs> sorry, under the histogram tab. If you don't have a histogram tab, then you can Google how to add a box and whiskers plot to Excel 2007 or whichever version you have, or you can simply miss these points. 
um, but you can still include it in your report even if you can't show it. And I've even had some people write me a note, Miss Binzi, I did not have that feature on my Excel, so I created a picture of it and they did, people have done things by inserting um, shapes and actually just creating the things that they're supposed to create. I've given full credit to some people for that because they've done such a fantastic job with it. And I just love that you're using things going be outside the box, beyond your capabilities here on Excel and creating ways to show your data, even though you can't do it exactly the way I'm showing you how. For, for those of you who've taken the initiative and who are going to take the initiative to do that, you rock. All right, so now here, what did we say? We're looking for, we've already done all our scatter plots. We're looking for our box and whiskers. And I'm just gonna set this right here. Now look, folks, super cool. Let's see, I guess I do need to keep this just a little bigger. I don't need it to be wider, but I do need it to be taller, don't I? so that we can get just a little bit of a look at what's going on here, because this one's pretty tight. See how tight this is? What's the range here? The range was from 66 to 80. That's only a range of 14. So from the minimum to the maximum is goes from 66 to 80. And really, you know, it would have been helpful to reorder this from the greatest to the smallest if I knew it was going to make my box plot in a different order, but that's fine. Now, look at your mean here. Or I'm sorry, your median. We always use a median when we're talking about box plots. The median here looks like it's about 72. See, 72. And I see my median is 72 here. And I also can see that 72 is the center data value. I'm going to go ahead and highlight that. Does it tell me to highlight stuff? Create a box and whiskers plot for each set of heights. After you create the box and whiskers plots, reorder your list of heights. Okay, we have already done that. And highlight Q1, the median, and Q3, the min and the max values for each list. All right, super. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to highlight my median. I'll go ahead and make that yellow. Um, and then it wants me to highlight my Q1 and my Q3. Well, Q1, folks, look, my median's whatever values smack in the middle. And then my Q1 is smack in the middle of my upper set of data. So my Q1 is going to be whatever's in the middle of this set of data. I guess I'll go ahead and put some borders on that. Oh, now I got that. I changed that. I don't like those lines. It makes me feel a little dizzy. Hit escape. See that pencil? I just hit escape and then I can hit my borders again. It'll give me what I want. All right. So um, here I have my median, my upper set of data, and then this is my lower set of data. And my Q1 here, folks, is whatever's smack in the middle. Well, this is an even number of data entries. So smack in the middle means the average of these two values. 68 and 71. I can press equals and then I can add these two together and divide by two or I can just press average and select. Yikes, that got a little hard, didn't it? <laughs> Is that right? To 60? Yes. All right, and then I hit enter and it will give me the average of this set of data. So this is actually my Q1 is 69.25. Well, look at my chart here. See if this will work. I'm going to make this real, real big. Well, it doesn't really get that big, but does it look like that's at about where it said Q1 is 69.25? Does that look like 69.25? That corner right there, see it? That corner is 69.25. All right, so then we're going to calculate Q3, which to calculate Q3, we simply want to know the average of the lower half of the data. 
which is 75.5. And if you guys look at this corner right up here, it looks like it's right, right about in the middle, 75.5. And look, I didn't even know I could do this until right this second. If I hover right on this corner, it actually gives me the plotted point. This says 74.5, but that's because I'm not like really right in the corner. I'm a little bit off the corner. But anyway, that's pretty cool. I did not know you could hover on a box plot and get your values. All right, so all of that's done. I am going to go ahead and I would have liked to label my Q1 and my Q3 here. So I'll just go ahead and put Q1 right above it. Q3 above this one. And I'll just make all these centered. How about that? We'll center those values. Doesn't that look nice? And then we'll even give them a little color. Even though I didn't really, I really wanted you guys to do some of this stuff on your own, but but I think it's fun to do too. So now what's the problem I'm going to run into over here? I didn't leave a place to do my Q1 and my Q3 off to the side. So I'm going to pause this for just a second. Okay, so now you guys will create your box plot for this set of data over here. You are going to recognize that the data is much more spread out. Whoops. Move this chart right over here. I've gone over my time for this problem. I didn't really want to try to keep these each at 20 minutes. But I, I cannot go back and redo the video because I'm running out of time to get my other work done. So here we have this set of data and you guys can look at the same thing. We have a mean here a mean of 58.9 so you can see that's real close to 60 um, my q1 looks like it's going to be about 48 or so my q3 looks like it's going to be pretty close to 70 so i could easily calculate that real quick um, by selecting my data where's my mean in this set of data it's going to be right here all right so i'm going to go ahead and C, if I can just use this, control C, control V. Let's have a look. I went from Juliet 57 to 60. That's Juliet 57 to 60. And I know it's covering it up, but I can see that my median is at 61. So clearly 60 is the right the right one so it did catch the proximities always double check folks always could be just a little thing wrong here and then of course I would make this look like the other one color it in blue and things all right let's get and we can check that what did we say down here about 46.25 sounds good that looks like what did we say about 47 48 and then the upper piece is 71.25 and if I made this bigger, I would be able to see it maybe a little better. I don't know. But coming back over here, make this small so you guys can get a look at the whole thing. All right. So coming back, let's have a look. Uh, notice the correlations between the box and whisker plots, ranges, and your highlighted values for the quartiles of the heights. All right. We got all of our quartiles. We did that. Notice the correlation between the ranges, standard deviations, and the coefficients of variation. So you guys can remember that we had a tight set of data up here. Our coefficient of variation was tight. And our interquartile range, which an interquartile range is just this blue part. What's between Q3 and Q1? It's just actually Q3 minus Q1. I think we'll do that in another problem here coming up. But this is my interquartile range. Here my inner quartile range is wider, my standard deviation is wider, and my variation is bigger than this other set of data. All right, and then the rest is just to write a report about everything that we talked about, and I hope that helped, 
and we'll be ready to move on now to number three. Hi everybody, I'm ready for number three, but I did want to just go back to number two for a second because I forgot to discuss quickly about these heights of the soldiers and the mall shoppers. I know we've talked about this on other videos, but for this video, let's look at, remember the tightness of our data here and the looseness of our data for the heights of the mall shoppers. And I just wanted to quickly talk about why we did a problem in our module two Excel report that showed us the probability of a soldier of an army recruit being a male. So we could think about that when we discuss this. If we did have a lineup of army recruits, it would be likely that they were from the same platoon, which is makes it likely that they were either all male or all female. Uh, more likely that we had males in this case because of the probability and the, of the heights. Because of the heights, the probability that they're males is higher. And the fact that they're army recruits, the probability that they're males are higher. So that's why our data set is tight here. It looks like we may be looking at all males in the military, or at least all the same sex. And when we're looking at the shoppers in the mall, we could have everything from little children all the way to, to tall people. So we have all different heights of people in the mall shopping where the army recruits we don't. So there's the differences in those data sets. Also, the other thing that I, I wished I had mentioned for each problem is the fact that we did not put in a report. Please make sure your reports are going down. I don't want these blocks for your reports to be all the way over on the side because when you scroll to do your Excel Zoom report, I want you to be able to stay not scrolling left to right, but scrolling only up and down. This is gonna be kind of a long report, so you know, give it a nice wide shape. If you don't have the option to insert a text box, then what students have been doing is they have been inserting shapes and typing in the shapes. People have come up with some pretty cool different things that they're putting in there. Um, some people are even putting pictures of themselves as avatars with words coming out of their mouth. It's pretty cool what you guys are coming up with. You rock, seriously. All right, and don't forget your report up here for the first one too. All right, let's move on to number three. I've already gone ahead and put all of my information in here. I labeled my problem. I set up my data. I just cut and paste from the last question with my mall shoppers here. And I'm gonna change that from mall shoppers. Looks like I didn't quite merge all of my cells here. And if you ever can't find, like right now I couldn't find my merging, it's because I'm not on home. So just go up here and click on home. All right, now uh, this is, these are IQ scores of 20 psychology students. I'm just going to grab that and put it into this cell. All right, things are getting pretty easy here. Now to find my range, remember we have to order our list from least to greatest, which this particular list for number three is already done for us. I got a little ahead of myself here, didn't I? All right, I entered all this data in for number three, but let's go back and actually look at number three. We have a list of 20 psychology students who took an IQ test as a class experiment. We're gonna calculate the range, median, mean, and standard deviation, and the coefficient of variation. That's why I went up and just selected what I had done on that last question because it was all the same stuff. Then um, reorder the list. In this case, we don't actually have to because it's already in order. And we're gonna find our Q1, median, Q3, and then calculate the interquartile range and the upper lower bounds to check for outliers. We're gonna create a bell-shaped curve and then we're gonna plug some different values in and look at how our data changes and then we're gonna write a report about that. So let's go ahead and just get started with this different, these, oops. When you, when you click the wrong thing, that can happen. Just gonna undo that. All right, so for this range, I need to know um, my bottom value is correct, but my upper is not. Hit enter. My median is for the entire set of data. And my mean, and you guys can just 
hover right here over these numbers and double click one two double click and it will select that for you instantly sometimes getting just the right getting the cursor in just the right place can be frustrating now I'm just kind of going through this part quick because we've already done all this so many times all right and I'm right now I'm just double clicking inside of my cells to make sure I got everything and I did my coefficient of variation will still grab the proximity here of my standard deviation divided by my mean so I'm good there all right it looks like everything's set up nicely so um, a couple things I have to do next reorder your list all right so here now I want to look for my q1 q3 and my median so I'm going to go ahead and 126 look at my list folks um, I was just going to I have one two three four five six seven eight nine 10. I know I have 20 of these guys, so my list could easily be cut in half of 10 and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It looks like I've missed a data entry. So um, I'm going to pause the video quickly. Okay, that didn't take long. I found my missing data entry was my last number, 129, so that made it easy. All right, I'm going to go ahead and give this a border. Um, I want my border to be black. And so I'm going to do all borders. All right, now um, I have a median. Well, you guys remember up here in this problem, we had nine data entries. That's an odd number. So an odd number of data entries gave me the median right, right here in the middle. This is the median. I just realized this should have been just these two numbers. Did I do that on all of those? I know it's aggravating when I, when I go back and do this. But I just realized um, I had taken the average of all of these values, and it was just supposed to be the two values. So you guys can fix that over here also. Sorry about that. This one's hard to get to. So what was that? 63 and 64. So that's 63 and 64. All right. And I just realized that because I'm about to talk about it. We had an odd number of values here. So our median was right in the middle. Up here in the top half of our data, we only had four entries. So in order to find my Q1, I had to find the average of these two data entries because it's right smack in the middle of those two. And that's what we're gonna end up with down here. We don't have a middle value because we have an even number. So I'm gonna create myself a little chart over here. Let's see, uh-oh. My chart, and guys, I know I don't do everything perfect, but um, I'm doing my best because I'm learning this too. We have our Q1, our median, our Q3, what else did it tell us to find? Our inner quartile range, and then our upper and lower bounds. All right, and on my upper and lower bound, um, the word bound doesn't quite fit, so I'm gonna go ahead and extend this just a little. I'm just going to drag this down just to keep me. Now watch this, you guys. If I want to select this word upper, I just double click it. Well, first I have to be clicked in the cell and then double click and it will select one word. But watch what happens when I triple click one, two, three. It selects the whole cell. So you guys could keep that in mind when you're doing things. All right. So let's go ahead and see what kind of calculations we can come up with. I'm going to give my chart a border. 
And let's see, our Q1 is going to be, well, I'm already on blue. My Q3 is going to be blue. And my Q1 is going to come from the green upper half. I'm just doing it like this just because. Let's see, my median. Let's make it a, let's do that color. And then the IQR, the upper bound, and let's, just go ahead and make our IQR some color, whatever color, it doesn't matter. And then my upper and lower bounds. I don't know. What do you say? Blue? Sure. We already had blue. Okay. Um, how about gray? How about that? That's at least something a little different, but not much. All right. So my median, I'm just going to go ahead and start with my median because it's right in the middle of my entire data set. My median is going to be the median of the entire data set, right? And of course, I already have the median calculated, so I could actually just select that cell right there. But what if I had a mistake? I don't know. Might just do it again just to see. 103.5. Why? What happened? Uh oh. Remember when I didn't have that 129 there? Darn. So this has to go all the way down to 121. I missed that. So now, yay, I get to change each one of these zeros to a 1. I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. Control C. If you guys didn't type your data in wrong, all of yours should already be correct. Please keep in mind that it was never meant for me to do these guidance videos. So rather than being aggravated with my errors, please be thankful that I'm doing the, the full excels with you guys. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So my median was 103.5. It's now the correct value. Good thing I went and checked that. So now I have my Q1 here. My Q1 is going to be the middle value of my upper half of data. Well, uh oh, there's one thing I wanted to do first. My median is right below this 103. So just to show it on my chart, I am going to put a border on the lower half of that cell. So a bottom, a thick bottom border. You see that? I'm going to put a thick bottom border in there. And I am going to make that border red. How about that? All right. And then also, what else do I have here? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. All right. One, two, three, four, five. And I'm just double checking. One, two, three, four, five. All right, cool. I have now I've marked my Q1, my median, and my Q3. So to get rid of that pencil, you just hit escape. All right, my Q1. I'm not sure why that's happening, but my Q1 here, I put it in equals. And now I want to do. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you guys a mistake, and then I'm gonna show you. I have this value plus this value divided by two. I know some of you are out there already yelling at me, but others of you have no idea what's going wrong here because I've been helping you with this, um, you know, throughout the last two weeks. So what happens when I hit enter here? I get 143.5. Folks, does 143.5 look like it's right between 95 and 97? No. And some of you are just going to know this is 96, but, you know, I want you guys to see here. What's wrong? My calculator, my Excel, did the order of operations. It did the division before the addition. So I have to tell it to do the parentheses first and just put some parentheses around my numerator. All right. Now I have my QL. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is QL. I have my Q1 right between 95 and 97. My Q3, I'm actually just going to go ahead and copy that Q1 because it's already got the parentheses and the 
addition sign. It's already got everything I need. And now I'm just going to change these to be the ones that I need them to be. All right, and now guess what the IQR is? It's the inner quartile range. It is this blue piece on the box plot. I'm back up to number two if you didn't see me scroll. It's the inner quartile range is Q3 minus Q1. It just gives me the space right here. So that's all I'm calculating right here is Q, I need an equal sign, Q3 minus Q1. All right, now what is an upper bound? The upper bound is the, um, the, the information that's gonna help us decide on whether or not we have an outlier. So the upper bound is going to be the values from, hold on, I'm so sorry, I just got distracted. Let me pause this for just a second. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so let's get back to work. Our upper bound is, what this upper bound is, is it's Q3. This is our Q3 right here. And we're going to add one and a half times the interquartile range. Um, we actually don't create a box plot for this until part delta. Where does it say create a box plot? Well, I don't know where it says to create a box plot, but I'm going to go ahead and create one because it's going to be easier for me to show you guys where this information comes from. So insert a box plot. All right. Whoa. All right. So the upper bound is going to be the third quartile. And this is how we check for outliers. What we're doing right now is we're checking our data for outliers to see if we have any. My quartile three, which is this corner right here, and then we're gonna add one and a half times this entire inner quartile range to that. So we're going to take our Q3 plus 1.5 times our inner quartile range. And we find that our value is 148.5. So what that means is unless we have a data entry greater than 148.5, it is not an outlier. So any data entry greater than 148.5 would be an outlier on the big end. Let's check for an outlier on the lower end. What do you think we're going to do? I'm going to take my first quartile. And this time I'm going to subtract one and a half times my inner quartile range. And I find that I don't have any outliers on the lower end of the data because it's not an outlier unless it's less than 64 and a half. Pretty cool, huh? You guys may have calculated some outliers in your homework and found that it's a little complicated, but with Excel, it's just that simple. All right, now we are going to create our bell-shaped curve. Inner quartile range. So we do need to add something on here about inserting a box plot. Um, create a box plot to show, create a box plot of the data. How about that? Okay, I guess the original instructions did not have us create a box plot, but I think we definitely should. It makes it a little easier to see, and it looks cool. All right, now we are going to move. I know I said I didn't want you guys doing stuff to the left and right, but we are going to go ahead and um, put some data here to the left here in a minute. First, let's go ahead and create a standard deviation chart. In my standard deviation chart, I always have my median. 
I'm sorry, my mean. And for my mean, I am going to, I like to be a little fancy. Folks, please, if I have gotten literally text message and emails saying, Miss Benzi, I've spent a half an hour looking for the symbol and I can't find it. Do I have to put the symbol? No, folks. This whole Excel that I'm doing is my Excel. You can create your Excel how you want to. You're not a math major, so you might not use these fancy symbols. You just might write the word mean, and that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm going to write mean, and I'm also going to center it because I like my stuff centered. Now, remember, the, and what I'm doing here is I'm going to create my little chart. I always have my mean in the middle, and then I have my first standard deviation. So I'm going to ins insert my sigma here. And you guys can write STD1 or, you know, whatever you come up with. But I'm going to use my standard deviation symbol because I know how and I like it. And you guys can always look here. Um, when you're searching for these, you can search the Greek. You know, you could Google it. You could You can just Google it and cut and paste it and put it in there. All right, I did one too many. So that's going to be my first standard deviation. And then my second, third, and we don't normally go to a fourth standard deviation. But for the sake of this exercise, I'm going to go ahead and go to the fourth standard deviation. We don't even call it a fourth standard deviation. I'm just going to move out there. Three, and I'm going to call this four. Now I am going to center all of this. And I'm going to copy and paste it right over here, which didn't work, did it? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and move this down. And then I'm just going to move these cell by cell. And there are other ways to do this, folks. I don't know if this is being lazy or cool. I don't know. But that's how I'm doing it. All right. Now, these are negatives. This is negative one standard deviation. This is negative. Uh-oh. You see, once I put that minus sign in there, um, it, it thinks I want to do something fancy, and I don't. So what I have to do is put a... An apostrophe there one apostrophe okay so I'm gonna go ahead and copy that negative sign and the apostrophe control C enter and then I am going to control V that into each of these cells make sure you're hitting enter all right super now I have these standard deviations. I'm going to go ahead and make them blue. Because remember, our bell-shaped curve has these standard deviations listed under it. So now let's talk about our standard deviations. First of all, do we know what the mean is here? Make this a little smaller so we can see. The mean of this set of data is typed right here. I'm just gonna go, oh, it's not working because I did not put my equal sign. So right below my mean, I'm gonna put an equal sign and then I'm just gonna click the mean there. Please make sure you do it this way because when we start experimenting in a minute, all your stuff's not gonna change the way it's supposed to if you don't do this properly. All right, so now I am going to click enter, I'm sorry, equals. And what is one standard deviation? Well, it's the mean plus one times the standard deviation, which is right here. Enter. And what is the second one? I'm just going to go ahead and copy this all the way across here. And then...
And then what? What I'm checking to see is if it kept my standard deviation. And it did. All right, so now this one is two times the standard deviation. And you know, just to be safe, I'm not sure why it didn't change. It usually does. I'm going to go ahead and lock this value in because I do I don't want my standard deviation to change. I'm just locking it in. All right, so then what we had two times the standard deviation. Looks like it barely changed, doesn't it? And then I have three times my standard deviation. I'm actually going to go back and make sure all of this is correct. Okay, so there's something bad happening here. I can tell by the way my numbers are not changing properly, and this is the problem. For this one, I chose my mean. My mean. See, it says India 134. And then for this one, it moved it to Juliet. So all of this is wrong. So I need to go back to my first standard deviation, and I need to lock that mean in just like I locked in my standard deviation. So it's not optional to use these dollar signs. Using the dollar signs means don't change the proximity. So now I can move all of these over and it has it, now everything's the same. So now I can go in and just change this number. It's, it is the mean, the mean plus two standard deviations, the mean plus three standard deviations, and the mean plus four standard deviations. All right, now I can use this. I'm just going to control C, move it over here to control V. And now it is the mean minus one standard deviation. Whoops. The mean minus one times the standard deviation. I'm just going to drag all this over here. This one is the mean minus two standard deviations. Make sure you hit enter after you change these numbers, you guys. If you don't hit enter and you just try to click in the next cell, it's going to keep changing everything. I'm sure you've already found that out. All right, this looks very sloppy. All these decimal points are just make it look confusing to me. So I am going to go ahead and change all of these to be, what do you think, two decimal points or, or just one? Let's just do one. I'm also going to center this data just because it looks good that way. All right, super. I'm going to go ahead and give it some borders. Oops, that just, remember I was on the, just the bottom. Go back to all borders. And they're red, and I don't want my borders red. I want my borders black. Hit escape and hit all borders again. All right. So now, um, let's, there's another thing I would like to do here. I would like to show my percentages. I know that this, from the mean to the first standard deviation, is 34.1%. And we've actually looked at this. I'm actually going to write this as 0.341 and then change it to percent later. Um, this one is 13.6. This is 1.2. And I'm saying one thing and typing another thing because I'm saying it in percent, but typing it in a decimal value. Um, and all the exactly the same stuff over here. All right, I now have my percentages. I'm going to go ahead and change all these, select them, and change them all to percent. And I need some more decimals. Our decimal values at least to the tenths place on most of these problems. All right, I have now I have this stuff set up. 
<clears throat> I needed this before I created my bell-shaped curve. I guess I'll, I'll move this down now. I'm going to need to move it down here in a minute. So we actually did this in, in our very first Excel report. Those of you who did number four, the extra video I posted because I initially had the wrong number four, this is the exact same problem. So I'm going to find the numbers from, it looks like 79 all the way to 158. I'm just going to take the values from this chart. I guess I'll just go to from 80 to 158. Those are the numbers that I need to create my chart. So from 80 to 158, what's that going to be like 180 numbers? So I'm going to make this small so you guys can see fully what's happening here. Whoa, whoa, not that small. Make sure your video doesn't look like that, you guys. When you show your video, please make sure it's big enough to see everything. All right, so you saw here, my very lower end here is 80, right? And my upper end is 158. That's where the values from the mean could go to. I know um, our values are not going that low and that high, but we want our bell-shaped curve to show the possibilities of um, where the outliers would be sitting. And what were our outliers? Outliers were greater than 149 and less than 64 or 65. So our, our, our outliers could still be mentioned in the sets of data. All right, so from 80 to 158. I'm just going to make myself a list here. I'm going to start at 80 and then 81. And I am going to drag this all the way down. You see how the number to the right there, it says 106, 107, 109, 110. I'm going to take this all the way down to, what do we say, 160? Or we said 158? All right, there we go. Now, in order to get my bell-shaped curve, I need to figure out what the normal distribution is of each of these values. So in order to do that, I am going to... Put in normal distribution here. Normal distribution. And normal distribution wants the x value, which is right here. My mean, which is right here. And what happens with the mean? Well, let's talk about that in a minute. And my standard deviation. And then a cumulative is always going to be false for this class. Now, think about what's going to happen. I'm about to drag this all the way down because I want to distribute this for each x value, and I want each x value to change as I apply the formula, but I do not want my standard deviation and my mean to change. So I'm going to lock those cells in with my dollar signs. And when I lock it in, if you guys didn't notice or you haven't done one of the previous, which please don't try to do these videos, without doing the previous videos. All right, there, I locked in by putting a dollar sign on each side of the letter that represents the column number, or column, the column part of the address, the vertical part. So now I'm just, oh, I forgot, I have a fancy trick to do here. Once I did that and I want to apply it all the way down to the bottom of this column next to it, I just get my X or my black cross and double click and it just instantly applies it. Isn't that cool? All right, now I need both of these sets. So I select those two, double click. It will give me both full sets, and then I insert a scatter plot with smooth lines. All right, so something's missing. Oh. Do you see what's missing on my data set? This, the reason for this is because I went to 80, but 80 was rounding up. I needed to actually go down to 79, didn't I? 
So what I need to do here is insert, I'm actually just going to select these two things and drag them up. And that will give me my 79. Get rid of this bell chart, bell shaped curve. Select, double click, and insert a smooth bell shaped curve. All right, I still did not get the result that I want. And um, I'm gonna just check something's wrong with the, the lower half of my data. So I'm gonna come back over here and see what it was. And look, there it is. Remember I was going through and doing all these and I copied and pasted it. This was not four times. It was supposed to be a four right there. So I'm just gonna check my others as well. This one was also wrong. This was supposed to be a three. This is a two. And that was a one. All right, so really I needed this to go all the way down to 53. No problem. Select these two and then just take it. Just take it a little more. What do I need? Four more here. One more. And when you guys see that E show up, that's okay. It's just scientific notation. That's 8.1 times 10 to the negative 6, looks like. All right. Um, it's awful small. I just can't see that well. Now let's see what happens. Select those two, double click, and um, insert a scatter plot. Yay, look at that. So all kinds of little things that can tell you if your data is wrong, if you did something wrong. I'm going to drag this down here. And I am going to stretch it out. All right. Now I have my bell-shaped curve. This is quite awesome. Because look at my bell-shaped curve. It shows my mean at 105. And you know, I just created all this. I can't make it line up perfectly, <laughs> but I can show you that my mean is 105.7. If this is 100, this is 120. That's clearly right about in the middle. Oh, look, I can even put my cursor right at the tip of that. And it will actually give me the values. So I can see that my mean is pretty much right at the tip. And then at my first standard deviation, is 92.7 and you can't actually look at this grid because it doesn't go along with our curve but when you look at the where the where the standard deviation normally sits you can find that now what i want to do is look at some different distributions let's just go back and see if we're forgetting anything in here create a bell-shaped curve to represent the distribution of the data uh, write a report. It looks like we've, oh, coefficient of variance and include. All right, I think we've done everything. So what I want to do now is we are going to change some of these values and, and see what happens with our data sets. What if we did have an outlier? Well, what does an outlier have to be? Well, if I want my outlier in my upper set of data, that's the, the data to the right, then I am, or in this chart, the data at the top, I would need, if I wanted an outlier, I would need a number greater than 148.5. So I'm just going to try, I'm just going to put an entry here and just see what happens. What if I had an outlier here, and let's say the outlier is 200. Look what happens to my data set. I get this little dot all the way up here. That's my outlier. Can you guys see that? I know it's so small. This little dot up here is my outlier, the 200 that I just entered in. What happened to my median? Well, let's let's go back. I'm just going to click backspace and go back again. Try to get rid of that value. All right, there we go. Now let me zoom in a little more. And change that again to 200. All right, 
Now, you see that little dot? That's an outlier. That's what an outlier looks like in a set of data. And I wanted to show you guys. It's not really working out for me, is it? All right, you see my median and my mean? Watch what happens when I put my outlier back. My median does not change because the median was the value in the middle of this data set. The mean, on the other hand, changed, didn't it? The mean changed, but the median did not. Throwing that outlier in skewed my data. It drug the mean to the lower set. Let's see what that looks like in our, oh, and what about the standard deviation and the variance? Look at this. Here our standard deviation is 12 and our variation, our coefficient of variation is 0.12, which isn't too bad. And then look what happens now. Look at my standard deviation. It changed to 24 because it took the average distance between each set of data. And putting that big distance between 126 and 200 changed the average of the distance between each set of data. All right, now let's look at our bell-shaped curve. I wonder if it'll let me scroll and still undo and do. All right, so with my bell-shaped curve, before I changed my data set, I had a very lovely normally distributed set of data. But once I put that outlier in there, it drug my data over. You see how my upper level, this is no longer sitting, my mean is now moved over. And what is the mean now? Whoops, it's 109. So it's not real apparent here. Let me just see if I can make this a little more apparent. Just, just to see. Whoa, that was a little too big. Still pretty big. But you guys can see that everything changes when we have an outlier when our data is not normally distributed. So um, that's just a good discussion to have. I'm gonna put all this back to, what was it, 129? Make everything look beautiful again. And then we can start discussing um, our report about the measures of data and the effects of the outliers. And we can, you know, if you guys, of course, if you changed your lower set, you would get a different out, outlier and a different skewness when we, this was actually um, left a tail on the left-hand side, which meant that our data was skewed left um, once we put that outlier in. And also uh, when, what else? Plug in some outliers, check your observations. The difference between percentile rank. Okay, so here, where did it tell us to do percentile rank? Let's calculate the interquartiles. All right, so we have to discuss for this problem the difference between percentile rank and, and rank. So we can actually do this pretty easily. Let me move this over. And... I wonder if I can move this whole set down without changing anything. All right, excellent. All right, so I'm gonna make this my percentile, and then I will make this my rank. My percentile, is always the percentile is the is the the ranking of the number i'm going to press pause here for just a second and go to this problem on the actual um exam question from from the textbook and see what i left out when i typed it in over here so i'll be right back okay i i did miss this entire part here so I went back and added that in. So now your A, B, C, D, E are, are different. There is a B added, which I did not initially see. Sorry about that. All right, so our percentile rank is 
the num okay so 86 on the percentile rank is going to be very low because it's the number of entries below 86 divided by the total number of entries so in order to get that number i am going to ask excel to count the number of values from 86 all the way to its own self, 86. So in this case, I'm always going to start with the first value. So I'm going to lock that value in. So I want to count how many values are from that first value all the way to the first value. So that's going to be that value all the way back to its own self because there are no values below that. So what was that? India 103. I'm just going to type it in. All right. So um, the number of values from the first value to the value I'm looking for, which in this case is the first value, and then I have to subtract one. And then I have to put all that on parentheses because I'm going to divide it by the total number of entries in this entire thing. And if I don't put my parentheses, then it will be negative one divided by that value. All right, so that's going to be divided by the count of this entire set and the count for the entire set also needs to be locked in because once I start applying my formula everywhere um, uh -oh. I was gonna try to click out of this and make it bigger because I can hardly see this should have thought of that before all right so I'm just gonna go ahead and hit enter it's asking me if I want it to close my parenthesis, I think. So I'm just going to accept the correction. All right, well, of course, the first one's going to be zero here because um, it's, you know, the number of entries before it divided by the total number, and there are no entries before it. So now I'm just going to grab this corner and double click, and it will apply this to everything here, which does not seem right so let's see we have our first cell the count of all of that and oh I see the problem okay so I did not lock these guys in remember I was about to lock them in but it was too small and I couldn't see so that has caused me a little grief because I don't want these values to change if you don't want values to change you lock them in you don't just type the numbers in because then if you have to change anything else, it doesn't change with it like we did with those outliers. All right, this looks good. Your last entry should always be 95. <clears throat> if you've ever heard people say you're in the 95 percentile or you, you might hear that about your kids, um, ACT or what are the, the whatever tests they take. In the elementary and lower grades, you might hear him say, your kid, your child scored in the 95 percentile. Well, that's as high as you can get. We don't have a 100 percentile. 95 is as high as you can get. So your last value here should always be 95. So here you can see that this person scored in the fifth 5 percentile. This a score of 93 was in the 15th percentile. A score of 100 was in the 35th percentile. A score of 104 was in the 50th percentile. And a percentile means how many people scored below you. So 86, zero people scored below you. Here, 5% of the people scored below you. 10% of the people scored below you. Here, 50% of the people scored below you, and here, 95% of the people scored below you. And if you look at your bell-shaped curve, you'll see, where is 129? Well, 129 is um, 
on our data list here, 129 is going to be somewhere right about here. So you would be able to see that uh, how many people scored less than you will, almost all of them. And that's how your percentile rank goes. So the higher your percentile rank, that means the higher you scored. Now, what is the actual rank? Well, the actual rank is... all the values, the count of all the values whoops, all of these guys Close parenthesis. Minus the count. Whoops. Of the first value. I'm just going to have to do this because I don't know how else to do it. The first value to its until whatever one you're looking for, which in this particular case, I'm looking for that first one. So I didn't know how to make it select itself, so I just selected the two and changed the number. All right, now, what stuff do we want to lock in here? I want the count of all of my values. So I'm going to lock those in. And then, my other one goes from the first to whatever it is. So this last piece is the one that's going to change. Everything else will stay the same. And then I also have to add one to all this. All right, so look at this guy. He, was, he came in 20th. So for the percentile rank, the higher number, the better you ranked. For your actual rank, the lower you, the lower your number, the better you did. So this guy ranked 20th, and then this guy with a score of 129 ranked in the 95th percentile, and he ranked first. So there's the difference between percentile rank and rank. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of number three. Let's move, wow, 52 minutes. Let's move on to number four. All right, guys, let's go ahead and look at number four here on our Excel report. It says that the following data represents the volume in cubic yards of the largest dams in the United States. So we're going to calculate the range, median, mean, and standard deviation and the coefficient of variation for each set of data and make comments about the calculations on our report. We're going to calculate the quartiles, the IQR, and the min and max values for each set of data and check for outliers. Create a chart showing the XY coordinates listed in the chart below, then create a box plot and whiskers plot for each set of data. Oh yeah, this is this is one off your guys' homework a lot of you asked me about. So this will be really helpful um, for that. And then we're going to compare the information and the dam capacities in the U.S. and South America and discuss reasons for differences. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pause the video and get my data entered. I'm going to go ahead and list both of these sets separately and then I'm going to insert one of these little charts I created for number three for each set of data. So I'm going to pause the video and do that. All right guys, I went ahead and did all of this stuff. So I created my charts. Um, I did not mean to fill these values in. I'll do that with you guys. I, I just got carried away. <laughs> all right, so um, not sure. Oh, I think these. Yeah, I just need to expand these cells a little bit because the word bound, you could see where it says lower bound and upper bound. Just needed a little bit of expansion. Alrighty, let's get busy here. So I just took the charts from here and just 
Um, I'm able to cut and paste these, but I you guys um, can't open these this way. So I, whoops, did not mean to do that. All right, let's just start getting our data. Um, we have the range here. Are these lists already in any kind of order? Oh, I guess I also already ordered these lists. So put your list in here and then you can just order them. So I have my range is going to be, of course, the last minus the first. My median is going to be the median of all of the data. The mean is the average of all of the data. Standard deviation, STDEV of all of the data. And then my variation of coefficient, I'm sure we remember, is the standard deviation divided by the mean. All right, let's see what all I can do here. I don't know, the data sets are not the same size, but I can still save myself a lot of time by copying and pasting. It'll still grab my proximities, but they'll just be a little off. As you can see, this one is only supposed to go to Juliet 159. Whoops. Juliet 159, not 161. All right, I'm going to go ahead and select this and copy it because when I get to my median, Oh, I can't, that won't work, will it? That's okay. Won't be the same, but I can do it on this one. So for my median, I just want to select this set of data. And so I'm just changing it for each set here. I guess it's just easier to just select it. So it looks like I'm getting some stuff wrong. All right, everything looks good. Everything looks good. All right, and I'm just gonna double check this stuff over here. I think this one was off. Uh-oh. See where my average is somewhere way off there, so I'm just fixing this. And if your numbers were wrong and you noticed, good for you. Don't expect that all teachers are always right. Okay, there we are. Everything looks pretty good now. So I am going to follow my instructions, calculate all of those things, describe what the calculations mean. Well, it looks like the variation for the um, South American dams is pretty big, 0.74. We remember what a scatter plot looks like on that one. Um, we have a huge standard deviation and a huge range. It looks like the range for American dams is smaller. We actually have more dams, but a smaller range. And um, our standard deviation is significantly smaller. How many digits? We have five digits over here and one, two, three, four, five, six digits over here. And our variation is a lot smaller also, less than half. All right, so the next thing says to calculate the quartiles. All right, so our quartiles, this is, uh, let me see if I can pull this problem up. What is this? What problem was this? Number 27. So, oh boy, it's quite a ways. Okay, let me pause the video and find this. Okay, here we are. I know a lot of you remember this problem because I had a lot of questions on it. It seems really hard because of the way they've listed all of these Q1, Q2, Q3, and all the stuff. Q2 is always just your median, so you, in case you don't know that, I've 
typed it in over here as the median. Um, but all this means is it wants you to do Q1 to 1, Q2 to 1, Q3 to 1, and then what it's saying is your next coordinate is going to be Q3. So Q1 to Q3, I'll show you what that means. I'm not even going to explain this anymore, but this is what's about to happen. I'll come back and correlate it again here in a second. So I have my Q1 here. Well, what is my Q1? One, two, three, four. My Q1 is going to be the average of these two datas. These two, let's just make sure. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yes. So Q1 is the average of those two. Oh, I didn't want to do that right there. I wanted to do it right here. So we have Q1 is, whoops, sorry. Q1 is the average of these two entries. Um, this should say median. The median is going to be, actually these are all going to be averages, so I'm just going to keep that so I don't have to keep getting average. This is going to be the average of these two center values. And then the last one is going to be the average of these two values. My IQR is simply Q3 minus Q1. And to find out if I have any outliers, I simply take from my lower bound, I'm going to take Q1. What did I have these? opposite up there it doesn't matter let's see just control C control V control X and control V all right so we have our upper bound is going to be Q3 plus one and a half of the interquartile ranges and my lower bound is going to be Q1 minus one and a half of my interquartile ranges. Remember we discussed that um, up there on number two. All right, now I am going to just copy this whole thing. I changed a few things and paste it into this over here. Um, the problem over here, you guys, is that this data set is not as long as this data set. So it says it can't divide by zero. That's what that means. All right, so I have some different values here. Um, for this one, my Q1 is simply this middle data value of my upper set. Um, Q2 is going to be the average of the two middle pieces, which are right here. And then Q3, I don't have to average anything because I just have a center value for my lower set of data. And then my IQR, still fine. My upper bound, all of those should be fine. Um, yep. All right. All right, so it does not appear, let's see. My upper bound is 126, and look at my upper bound here is 125. So I almost got close to having an outlier, but but not quite. All right, what's next here? Uh, create the quartiles, create a box and whiskers plot. All right, so we are going to, I'm actually going to do my box and whiskers plot. Well, let's see, let's see how this turns out here. I'm gonna choose this set of data and insert, oops, on my histogram. Insert a box and whiskers. All right, so here I have a box and whiskers plot, and, and that's fine. Um, but I wanted to do this differently to show you guys. I'm going to actually do this in a way to help you see how to do that problem on your homework. So I am actually going to insert. Well, I'm actually not done yet. Because right here now, I need my Q1 is going to be right here. 
and I'm going to use Q1 for both of those cells. And then my median is going to be here. And I'm using that for both of these cells. And that's my Q2, remember. My Q3 is right here. Oops. I need my equal sign. Equals Q3. And that's going to be for two cells. And then I have my min. And my minimum value here. <clears throat> Oops, did not mean to do that. My minimum value is this value. Oh, I need an equal sign. And then um, I'm actually going to have to add another value here. And it's going to be my max. And, oops, I didn't really need to write that. My max is going to be this biggest number here. And that's, and these are both going to be on a two. All right, what does all this look like? This is Q11, Q, Q13. This, this is Q, wait, what happened? Q11, and this, oh, I know why, because I drug it down, is Q13. This is Q21, and this is Q23. This is Q31, and this is Q33. And the way I drug them down earlier messed them up. They were wrong. So I'm just going in and fixing them. Because I should have two exact values every time. This is Q11, Q13, Q21, Q23. These are points I'm going to plot. So I'm going to go ahead and select this data. And then, oh, and then I have my min and my max. These guys didn't get formatted, which I know is no big deal. All right, and then my min and my max. If I go back and look at that homework problem, that's exactly what it's asking for. See how it wants um, Q11 to Q13. Q11, I'm sorry, Q21 to Q23. Q31 to Q3. That's exactly what I just created in this chart. And then it wants the minimum to, um, where where is it? Draw a horizontal line from the minimum to Q1 and the maximum to Q3 starting at 2. So I'm going to have a minimum 2, maximum 2. And that's what I just did in my chart, the min 2, max 2. So now I'll just go ahead and leave that homework up there. I'm going to select this data, and I'm going to insert a scatter plot. Because the reason I did this scatter plot instead of the box and whiskers was because, first of all, I don't know how to make the box and whiskers plot lay horizontal the way this wants to be graphed but if you guys look here look this is q11 q13 q21 q23 q1 i'm sorry q31 q33 and then this is my minimum to my maximum to you guys see that that's just exactly what um that other this problem over here is asking you to do except it's actually asking you to draw the line so you click on vertical line and then you draw one line two lines three lines and then you come across and connect them and you create a, a little box out of that okay all right so I'm just gonna do the exact same thing over here so when you guys turn this in you will have two boxes like this um, again you just put your equals did we already do these calculations or did I cut and paste this? I think I just cut and paste this, didn't I? All right, so we have Q1 there. 
um, Q3 is in the right place. My median. Okay, so it looks like I did do all this already. Perfect. All right, so then over here I have my Q1. I can't drag it down, but I can copy and paste it. My last one, I drug it down, so Excel changed things. Oh, I guess it still did not work, did it? All right, Q1, no problem. I just have to do this the hard way. I have to actually click on something twice. Forgot my equal sign. All right, and then um, I'm just gonna copy these little cells over here. Hopefully this will work. And paste them over here. All right, now I get my minimum value. Oh, it did actually get my minimum, excellent. And now I just need it to grab my maximum value and select data insert a scatter plot and there it is and you guys can see um over here on this first the united states dams of the united states this was the value that was almost my outlier remember i had a value that was close to an outlier that's what that is and over here it didn't look like i really had anything close to an outlier and my minimum value is very, very close to my quartile one. It's pretty close. You see the numbers uh, 56242, 56563. All right, I think that's it. You guys are going to talk about this stuff, the different distributions of the dams um, between the United States and South America. That's the end of number four. Let's move on to number five. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and look here at number five. Number five is giving, has given us a mean and a standard deviation for a test, a list of IQ tests that have been taken. We're going to create a standard bell shaped curve. We're going to label the standard deviation, calculate the Z scores, the percentile ranks, and the number of students for each possible score within four standard deviations of the mean. We're going to suppose that there are a thousand IQ scores reported in this data. And suppose the required score is 70%. We're going to discuss the number of students out of 1,000 who reached the required score. And we're going to discuss the number of students in the 20th percentile, the number in the 80th percentile, the number in the 20, between the 20th and the 80th percentiles, and write a little report that includes information from parts A and B, and which explains the data that can be used to project IQ scores of other populations. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing I did is I went up to, I think it was problem number three, and I cut and paste this little chart that I needed. Of course, I labeled my problem number and recorded my mean and my standard deviation. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and start by getting my mean into this box right here. And then for my next standard deviation, well, that's my mean for my first standard deviation. I have the mean plus one times my standard deviation. Um, I am going to keep using this, so I'm gonna go ahead and lock in my mean and my standard deviation so that it does not change um, when, I, when I apply this over. So I'm just gonna apply it to each piece here. Now this one is two times the standard deviation. three times the standard deviation, and four times the standard deviation. All right, and then I am just going to copy these into the corresponding standard deviations on the left-hand side. Just clicking in there and doing Control-C, Control-V. That's Control-Charlie, Control-Victor. I hope that you all realize that I am moving to the left side of my mean, so that means that I have to subtract my standard deviation and not add it. So I'm just gonna change each one of these to be a minus.
All right. Looks good. All right, now I know that my bell-shaped curve is going to run from 40 to 160. So now I need to create a list of data from one from 40 to 160. So I'm just going to do that right here from 40. And what, what are these? These are going to be the scores. The scores run from 40. I'm just going to select those two and then drag it all the way down until I hit 160 right there all right now for my set of data I need a um, normal distribution so I'm just gonna label this normal distribution and then I'm gonna put my normal distribution whoop All right, and then I'm going to select this. Oh, yeah, this is my X value. And then I need my mean, which is somewhere over here. My mean, comma, standard deviation, comma, false. All right, but then don't forget, I do need to lock in my mean and by standard deviation, because I want my normal distribution to change for each score, but I don't want it to change um, the mean and the standard deviation. So I have to lock those in. So now I just get this box, the cell, and double click with a black cross cursor in the bottom left, right corner, and it will apply the normal distribution to everything there. Select the top two values, double click, and now I am going to insert a nice, beautiful, normal bell-shaped curve. Very nice. Please don't forget to label, add all of your access titles and your data labels to everything. Don't worry about the y-axis. Um, you can Google that. It's a little more complicated than we're going to talk about in this video. So here I am going to just put this right above the mean. See my mean there? My standard deviations aren't really lined up too well. I guess I could stretch this out, probably get a little bit better. That looks good. Doesn't that look good? All right. It's about right. Not exact. You know, these things are created differently. They're not all combined. So, all right, fantastic. So now I have um, a nice bell-shaped curve. I can see my mean, my standard deviations. Now I'm going to do my, gre my green scores my uh, z-scores. So for my z-scores, I didn't mean to press equals there. z-scores are standardizing. Once I calculate the z-scores, I'm actually standardizing my data. I'm getting the average distance between data measurements, in this case test scores. So I am going to standardize equals standardize. And again, I need my X value, which is right underneath the score, so I cannot see it. That is going to be tango. Um, that's column tango, row 182. And then my mean, my standard deviation, and close. And then I am going to, whoa, whoa, did not mean to do that. I am going to lock in my mean and my standard deviation. All right, so simply just double click that and you can see the alignment of my standard deviations. Z scores and standard deviations are the same thing. Look at my Z score of negative four is a score of 40. Here my z-score of negative 4 is a score of 40. Um, a z-score of negative 2 is 70. You can see the alignment. You see that? Pretty cool. All right, now let's try our percentiles. This is um, the percentiles. The percentile is the number of data entries 
below the score you're looking at divided by the total number of data entries. So that means that I have the count. The count just tells us how many data entries we have. We need our equal sign in there. The count of the first score, whatever the first score is, so I'm going to lock that in because I'm going to use that for each one. The first score all the way to, well, the same first score. Is it going to let me select that? Yay, it does. All right, and I want that second one to change for every value that I do on the way down. I just noticed, if you guys didn't notice, that I did not properly lock that in. I put my dollar sign on the wrong side of that tango. All right, so it's... That's the number of scores from the first one to the one I'm looking for, which in this case is the first one. All right, and then I'm going to subtract, or no, I'm sorry, not subtract, but I'm going to divide that by the total number of, of scores, the whole entire thing. So I already know that's this first value. And that, uh-oh, what did I do wrong here? I did not press count. All right, from the first value all the way to the last value. And what is the last value here? Right here. All right, and then I want to lock in the the last value, because that's not going to change. The only thing that's going to change is that piece right there. All right, and this is getting locked in. Also, in my numerator, I do have to subtract 1 from my numerator. And once I subtract one, I'm going to have to put another extra set of parentheses around my numerator because otherwise it will divide, um, you know, before it subtracts. All right. So the percentile rank, a zero percentile rank. So if you scored um, a 40 there, All right, and now we're just going to apply this all the way down. I'm going to pause the video for just a second. Okay, let's keep going here. I went to your homework problem and grabbed the Z chart so that I can help you guys look at that too for just a second. All right, so um, here I want to look at the number of students who scored at least 70%. So the required score for this particular test was 70%. So we want to know the number of students out of 1,000 who scored that amount. So what I'm going to do here is look at my values that I have here. So I have that 13.6% of students scored between 70 and 85. That's what my standard deviation needs. 13.6 students scored between um, 70 and 85. So 13.6 plus 34.1 scored between 70 and the mean. So to figure out what percent of students scored 70 or above, I would simply um, percent of studs scoring at least 70%. Can I say it like that? All right, I'm just going to go ahead and merge these cells. And now to calculate that, I am simply going to put an equal sign and add. I don't add these two because these two are not over 70%. Add each of these percents. Do 
I want to accept what change. They found a typo. I don't know what it is, but I'll... Oh, I put a plus sign at the end. That was why. Wow, look. 97.6% um, of students scored. Had a lot of... Uh, most of the people seem to have scored... Sorry, I'm trying to get those decimals out of there. Um, scored above or at least 70%. So that's pretty good. Now I want to know how many students scored that that number. So... Um, Maybe it'll just let me copy this. Number of students scoring at least 70%. Well, that is 1,000, or well, I guess I could say this differently, 97.6% of 1,000. So I have 976 students scored um, above 70 percent all right so now let's discuss the number of students in the 20th percentile the 80th percentile and between the, the 20th and the 80th so over here i have my percentiles my percent oh i'm just gonna color this stuff so we can know what it is over here all right so the 20th percentile let's look at this goes it looks like right about here should i count one that goes over is this the price is right we can't go over i'm going to say we can't go over so i'm going to highlight those and then i'm also going to highlight the students in the 80th percentile which are all the way down here 80th percentile Looks like all of these guys are in the 80th percentile. All right, maybe we should highlight that a different color. And then we have all the folks in between. So how do I find out how many there were without actually counting them? Well, we've already actually learned how to do this. I have the... I know you guys probably don't want to look at that z-score chart. I might not look at it. It's not part of this problem. I just wanted to show you. I think I'll save that for another time. So here, um, I am going to put the, well, I'm just going to copy this little chart. And I am going to copy this last row. Nope, that did not work. All right, so I'm just going to bring this down. All right, so now I have the number of students scoring in the 20th percentile. I need more room for that one, no problem. I just um, merge some more cells, I think. I don't really know how that's going to work with my coloring and borders and all stuff. I could just change this. How about this? Instead of the word number, I'll just use a pound sign since it represents. Number of students scoring the 20th percentile. I'm just going to copy this whole thing here. Uh, control C. Control V. Control V. All right. All right. It doesn't look as great when it, as it did when it said the word number. Um, but it still looks good. Whatever I just did, I want to undo. All right, whatever's happening here isn't a big deal. All right, so now I want the number, oh wait, and what is this? This is the 80th percentile, and this is going to be scoring between the 20th and 80th percentile. 
All right, so um, some different things that I can do here. All I'm going to do, folks, I'm actually just going to grab all of this, or at least this last one here, and change my font size because trying to drag all this around is just going to take forever. All right, so the number of students in the 20th percentile is the, <clears throat> the count. of this set right here. And I don't need percent. This was just copied from that one above there. Um, so I am going to change this to a number. With no decimal places. All right, so now I want the number of students scoring in the 80th percentile, which is right here. Oh, darn. What did I do wrong? I didn't do it right because I didn't type count. So I'm actually just going to um, bring this all the way down since I'm going to be using the count key for each of these. So now here, I'm going to be counting this set of students. And then the number of students in between. And of course, this one, this set of data is only out of, um, I shouldn't really say the number of students here, should I? Um, this is out of, whoa, whoa, 160 scores. All right. So this is actually the number of scores in the 20th percentile. Sorry, I cut and paste that. All right. All right, so the number of scores is all of this. Is it going to work? Please work. Here we are. All right, so now we know I think he's going to change this to 277. There we go. All right. Something was wrong with one of those data entries, but I am not going to change it. I think we're definitely see how to calculate the 20th percentile um, and the number of scores between the 20th and 80th percentile. Now we can determine different things. We can see that we have 25 out of, what was it, 120 scores. Here we have 24 out of 120 scores. And I could, I could get fancier with this too. Here we have 71 out of 120 scores. And of course, um, if I'm not actually using these values, then if I need to change anything about my data, um, you know, everything won't change beautifully all together at once the way I like it to. And really, my denominator should have been count um, this whole set, but that's okay. And so then these are my percentages of scores between those. So I have 21% of the scores um, are in the 20th percentile and so on. So 
that is number five, folks. Let's move on to number six. All right, number six should go pretty quick. So in number six, we're given a bunch of blood alcohol levels, and we have studied the reaction time of adult subjects that are alcohol impaired in an effort alcohol impaired to study the effects of impairment on driving. The amount of time in seconds that 25 randomly selected adults took to react to a stimulus when they had a blood alcohol level of 0 0.08 was recorded and is displayed below. So here is our data set. We're going to calculate all of the stuff we've been calculating in it. And then we're going to create a histogram with seven bins. And then we're going to create a graph of the exact same data that looks like we're trying to argue that it doesn't matter who you are, your impairment is about the same no matter what um, when your blood alcohol level is 0 0.08. And then we're gonna let our graph represent um, the most people's, represent that most people's reaction time is delayed to an extreme level. And then we're gonna create another histogram that we're going to pretend like we're a person who argues, oh, everyone's affected differently by blood alcohol levels. You can't say that my impairment is going to be the same as their impairment because we all have such different reaction times and the, the reaction times really aren't that much difference. So we're going to actually change our data to look two different ways. So I'm going to pause the video and enter my data. All right, so I just went up and obviously cut and paste this from, from this particular problem. This is not Helena's missed classes. This is reaction time in adult subjects with a blood alcohol level. So I am going to put that here. Um, reaction time. All right merge some more of these cells to get that in there okay so now I have this stuff looks like it's already ordered um, here I have all my data was just entered in here and it's already in the right order so I'm gonna go ahead and calculate my range which is going to be my last entry minus my first entry my median my mean the standard deviation and then my coefficient of variation should be fine now I'm going to create my histogram select the data insert a histogram all right now for my histogram it says what create a histogram with seven bins so um, I am going to format this thing the bins are right here like for example this one has six bins it goes from 1.2 to 1.9 so I am going to click the x-axis here and then I want to format that axis and it wants to know how many I have choices I can either choose a bin width or a number for this problem it wants seven so I'm just going to change that number to seven and hit enter all right look at my data isn't it beautifully normally distributed here doesn't that look pretty all right well let's see what happens I'm going to and don't forget, you guys, please, you have to label your axes and, and do everything here. So I'm going to control C, control V this. And now I am going to I'm going to make some other changes to this. Um, I'm going to actually just make this big because I need to be able to see. So here um, on my changes, I'm going to go ahead and do a few things to this. First of all, let's see. 
Now we need this to get back. I want to, first of all, let's change, and I have already done a bunch of experimenting here, so I'm just gonna go ahead and save you guys the time so you don't have to experiment. Clicking my X axes, I'm actually gonna go ahead and click four bins again. Now remember, I'm supposed to make this look like everybody's blood alcohol level is the same and pretty much everybody's impairment's the same. This graph doesn't really depict that. But let's look over here at my Y axis. What if I changed my Y axis to have a maximum value of five? Wow, look at that. Isn't that something? Now it looks like some people are completely maxed out on impairment and other people are awful close, but everybody's really bad. Isn't that what that looks like? These two groups are completely maxed out to the top of the chart, which is true. They go over the top here. Um, this one has nine values and this one has eight values, so they actually go over the top. But here it just looks like everybody's about the same. Two groups are completely maxed out and two are close to that. All right, now I'm just I'm just control C, control V. I can actually just copy my whole um, chart here. Now I'm gonna try to make it look like everybody's, nobody's really that bad. And some people are way worse than other people. So let's see what that chart might look like. Um, this one, this chart here, is maybe something from Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, where they're really trying to show you, hey, everybody gets messed up with a 0.8 blood alcohol level, and look how they max it out. Now here I'm going to be the young person who thinks they can drink till their heart's content and still drive. I'm all right. I can drink 10 beers. I have a higher metabolism, and I weigh more, and all that stuff. So this guy is going to try to prove that to us. So now I'm going to change my bin number to be, I um, can't really remember what I did here, maybe like 15. And then um, I click down here on these values. Uh, and then go to number, and I want it to be a number, not general. I'm actually going to go up here and do that to this one too. All right, so now I'm still working on this one. Well, on this one, I cut off the ceiling, didn't I? I lowered the ceiling. On this one, I might want to do some other things. Um, let's go ahead and format this whole thing again. Look at our bin. Uh, let's see. We have our number code. We might want to do some things, like none of that stuff. Gap width, there it is. If I double click on my blue bars, I can change my gap width. Right now I have no gap. And now I'm gonna create a gap. Because remember, I'm trying to make it look like some people get really impaired and others really don't have a problem at all. I'm trying to show that there's a major gap between data here. So I'm also going to raise my floor. So now I'm going to make right here on my y-axis, my minimum is zero. I'm going to see what happens when I make my minimum value be um, one. Well, look at that. Now it looks like some people don't get impaired at all, while others are in pretty bad shape. I could even change my minimum to two. 
Whoa, watch this. If I change my maximum to 10, how does that look? Now it looks like hardly anybody is impaired at all. Some people don't even get impaired, but some are worse than others. And then this particular person might say, look at me, I'm in this category. I don't even hardly get impaired at all. So we can use the exact same data to create different charts to fool people. So when you guys are, you know, watching the news or looking at Facebook news, always make sure and check your charts that they start at zero and that the ceiling is where it's supposed to be. And you can check your, your data values also, mins and maxes and all sorts of different things. And let's see, was that it for... And then you're, you're basically just going to say what I said here, that this is the real data. This one is trying to make you think that everybody gets totally maxed out and paired. And the third chart is to make you think that everybody's different and most people don't even hardly get impaired. So you're just actually going to argue that both ways. And again, I did forget to put my um, report. Control C. I forgot to put that here. And at the bottom. And guys, that is the end of your Module 3 Excel report. I hope you have a little bit of fun working on this, and I hope you don't try to do it all in one day.